Welcome. <coughs> Professor Peter Machinist received his bachelor's degree from Harvard University, his master of philosophy and PhD degrees from Yale University, the Department of Near Eastern Studies, where he wrote his PhD thesis on that page turner, the epic of Tukulti Ninurta I. <laughs> Professor Machinist then came to Harvard University in 1991, where he is now the Hancock Professor of Hebrew and other Oriental languages in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations. He's also on the Faculty of Divinity at the Harvard Divinity School. Earlier, he taught in the departments of religion or Near Eastern studies at Case Western Reserve University, the University of Arizona, and the University of Michigan. He also served as a visiting lecturer and then later again as the Lady Davis visiting professor in Jewish history at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. In 2009, he was awarded an honorary doctorate from the University of Zurich in Switzerland. Professor Machinist's primary interest is in the cultural, intellectual, and social history of the ancient Near East, focusing particularly on ancient Israel and the Hebrew Bible and, uh, and ancient Mesopotamia. Within this framework, his research and teaching topics include the ideology of imperialism and other forms of group identification, ancient historiography, mythology, prophecy, Assyrian history, and the history of modern, biblical, and other Near Eastern scholarship. Among his numerous publications are a, a monograph on the provincial governance in Middle Assyria, a paper entitled Assyria and its image in the first Isaiah, Outsiders and Insiders, the Biblical View of Emergent Israel and its Contexts, a paper on the book of Ecclesiastes called Fate, Mikre, and Reason, Reflections on Kohelet and Biblical Thought, The Fall of Assyria in Comparative Ancient Perspective, and quite recently, a paper called How Gods Die, Biblically and Otherwise, and The Road Not Taken, Julius Wellhausen and Assyriology. Among his current projects is a volume of commentary on the prophetic book, Nahum. Merely to delineate his interests and publications in this way, however, is to do an injustice to the breadth and scope of his learning. He is truly an intellectual historian, a thinker of subtlety and sophistication, and one of the most learned scholars in our field. So, on behalf of the Kitts family and of Father Clifford, it gives me very great pleasure to introduce to you my teacher, my doctor of father, and my friend, Peter Machinist. Thank you very much, Professor Van der Hooft. Uh, in my tradition, we usually say something like, uh, Kavod Talmid, Kavod More, which from Hebrew into English, is that the honor of the pupil is the honor of the teacher. And I can certainly say that for David Vanderhoof, whose learning I have appreciated now for more than 20 years. And even when he was a student and I was officially one of his teachers, it was always a two-way street. I'm also very honored to be here tonight at this distinguished lectureship at Boston College to see a number of old friends, including Father Clifford, who published my first serious article in the Catholic Biblical Quarterly now many moons ago, and gave me a start in the field that I otherwise would not have had. And I appreciate the Kitts family for supporting and establishing this lectureship. The topic this evening, the problem of myth in the Hebrew Bible, continues to be exactly that, a problem. Even though some of the heat of this problem has passed, nonetheless, for many, 
the notion that the Bible, whether Old Testament or New, sometimes I will use for the Old Testament the term Hebrew Bible, for many, the notion that one can mix in a single breath the word myth and the word Bible seems to be an oxymoron of the first order. My wife, being a middle school science teacher, once said to one of her pupils, you've certainly uttered an oxymoron. Are you calling me a moron, Mrs. Machinist? <laughs> no, she said. The issue goes back to antiquity when we read already, for example, in the work of Philo of Alexandria, one of the great Jewish philosophers and biblical interpreters of the end of the first century BC and the first century AD, who writes in his text, The Confusion of Languages, he talks about the fact that there's an essential distinction between the Bible and the religions of the ethne, of the groups, in that the latter rests largely on myths, whereas the Bible contains history. Josephus, a slightly later historian of Jewry of the first century AD, writes in his antiquities, quote, other legislators, i.e. not Moses, in fact follow fables, tois mutois in Greek, follow myths, if you will, and they have in their writings imported to the gods the disgraceful errors of men and thus furnish the wicked with a powerful excuse. And this issue of myth as being somehow fundamentally opposed to both testaments, but for this evening I will concentrate on the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament, has continued into the modern era. I would like to quote what for some of you is very familiar, some of it rather specifically familiar to Father Clifford and myself because it comes from our late revered teacher, G. Ernest Wright. Ernest Wright was part of a major group of Protestant theologians in the middle and later decades of the 20th century who were initiators of a movement called the Biblical Theology Movement in which they tried to figure out what was distinctive about the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, vis-a-vis -vis the larger world of the ancient Near East, in which by that time everybody knew Israel had grown up. And in a book called The Old Testament Against Its Environment, the title says everything, published in 1950, this is what Wright has to say about myth. One further observation alone can be made here. That is the remarkable fact that the God of Israel has no mythology. Since history rather than nature was the primary sphere of his revelation, Israel's effort was to tell the story of her past in terms of God's activity. There was no necessity for nature myths. Notice how subtly he has qualified the term myth from a general proposition, no myth. Now he talks about a more specific group of nature myths. The God of Israel, and he calls him here by his name, Yahweh. You can call him a number of other things. My late colleague, Yochanan Mufs, I think used to have the name Jimmy. As a, as a traditional Jew, he did not want to use the name Yahweh, which seems to be the personal name of this God. At the same time, as a first-rank biblical scholar, he had to deal with the issue of the name and the fact that this is his personal name. So he said, let's call him Jimmy. So you can call him Jimmy if you'd like. Wright says, Jimmy, I mean Yahweh, for example, was no dying, rising God like Baal of Canaan. He was the living God. This phrase, used again and again so triumphantly, was a challenge to Canaanite conceptions. And Wright goes on from there. Myth, but then myth qualified as nature myths. This is not the world of the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament. That world is rather a world of God acting in human history. And this was arguably the central proposition of this biblical theology movement. On the Jewish side, there was also a challenge. 
from a different angle, from the great Israeli scholar Yechezkiel Kaufman, who wrote an eight-plus volume history in Hebrew, a history of the faith of Israel, Toldot Amuna Yisraelit in Hebrew, which was masterfully condensed and translated at least the first seven volumes by the late Moshe Greenberg. The last volume was published in English translation in full. And again, as is now clear to at least my colleagues here, uh, Kaufman, whose background was in the field of philosophical sociology, very important to understand Kaufman from this point of view, Kaufman argues that the whole concept of the God of Israel as the only God, philosophically and otherwise, he didn't use this metaphor, but if you were to argue that uh, there is a mathematical set called deity, then for Kaufman it has only one member, which is the God of Israel. And therefore, for Kaufman, mythology has no place in the Hebrew Bible. Well, what to do with various references to which we will come shortly that speak about the God of Israel fighting all kinds of monsters? For Kaufman, these are just essentially dead cliches. Again, this is my term, not his, but the notion is, and we'll have to come back to this point, that when uh, a text in Psalms says that God defeated the sea monster called Rahav, this is about the same thing as saying, this is bloody awful. How many people know that the origin of the English term bloody goes back to the blood of the virgin? Uh, we don't think about etymologies anymore when we use that term. Bloody simply is a, a superlative way to talk about something terrible. And Kaufman said, Yahweh defeating Rahav is equivalent. There was never any question of a battle. It was a dead cliche. And therefore, myth as a living element in the culture of ancient Israel had no place. These points of view can be extended well beyond the purview of the Bible, both Old and New Testament. Because today, we like to think of ourselves in the Western world as being beyond myth. Myth is something that primitive peoples, benighted folks, folks who don't have computers and don't have even telephones, indulge themselves in regularly. But those of us who are w raised in a Western post-enlightenment, post-18th century, orientation, who are the uh, bearers and heirs of all of the scientific developments of the last five centuries. For us, myth is just at the most a poor substitution for explaining the world uh, until you get something out of science. And yet, a moment's thought suggests that perhaps that kind of generalization really doesn't quite apply. We think about myths, or what we call myths, all the time. Sometimes we refer to it, the term negatively. This is a piece of myth, i.e. a piece of either primitive nonsense or out-and-out -out deception, which a more patient analysis will show is historically untrue and scientifically infeasible. And yet even in enlightened worlds or worlds that call themselves enlightened, myth has a role to play. I'd like to read you a passage here from a wonderful book called Lenin Lives by Professor Nina Tumarkin of the Department of History at Wellesley College. Lenin Lives, The Lenin Cult in Soviet Russia. This is a book originally published in the early 80s, then republished with new material at the end of the 90s. And it talks about the cult of Lenin that had begun already before he died. <clears throat> Here she's speaking about the uh, later decades of the 20th century when this cult began to wane, but at, yet at the same time, there were plenty of indications it was still alive for many folks. Throughout these, those last decades, she writes, the stale but stable cult of Lenin provided a mythic contour 
to the continuity of purpose that called itself socialism, but wasn't. In Eastern Europe, not Leninism, not Lenin, but the external trappings of the Lenin cult, the monuments, the posters, the renamed streets, squares, and cities, composed what today might be called the material culture of the Soviet empire abroad. In the USSR itself, the Lenin mausoleum continued as the axis mundi, the center of the world, of Soviet cosmology. Year after year in the spring and fall on May Day, Victory Day, and the November 7th anniversary of the revolution, aging leaders reviewed parades as they stood over the preserved body of the architect of Soviet socialism. In all those years, Tumarkin goes on, I knew only one person for whom Lenin was truly an object of adoration, a colonel of the Soviet Air Force, who walked in one day to a sculptor's studio to order a bust of Lenin for the officer's recreation hall of his nearby base. It will look so pretty next to a vase of flowers, he told me with animation. A handsome, sandy-haired man in his 30s, this colonel, as a child, had idolized Felix Derzhinsky, the zealous founder of the Cheka, the preceding form of the KGB. What about Lenin, I asked the colonel. Would you consider him a hero? Oh, he is beyond the category of hero, came the reply. He is something sacred. Tumarkin goes on, something, not someone. This verbal distinction rendered Vladimir Ilyich, Lenin's first two names, that much more remote. And you know, we don't have to go to Russia, either in Soviet or post-Soviet days, to find similar kinds of issues. The power of myth, I suspect, stands still with us despite all the disclaimers, because it has something to offer. And what that is, I'd like briefly to explore with you this afternoon. But first, let's come back to the problem of myth in the Hebrew Bible. What exactly is a problem here? The biblical text of the Old Testament makes the point at a number of different places most prominently in the book of Deuteronomy, that the experience of Israel and the nature of its God are unique in the world around it. Book of Deuteronomy is a book that very much is in contact, in conversation, in confrontation with this outside world. And at a number of points it says things like, what other nation had a God like ours who went into another nation, namely Egypt, and took us out? from this cauldron of fire? Or what other nation went through the experiences that we went through subsequently, through the exodus and the wanderings in the wilderness, and now we're ready to enter the land that has been promised to us? So a book like Deuteronomy, and indeed much of the Old Testament, is devoted on the one hand to recognizing there's an outside world, but on the other hand to finding the distinctive characteristics that separate us from them. There's something, in other words, in the biblical text that, that displays a certain intense fascination with who we are. All peoples, all individuals have to deal with this question. Finding out what identity is, is finding out in part who you are not. But in the biblical text, this notion of self-identity is raised to a consummate art, and it pervades not only the book of Deuteronomy, but much else in the Hebrew Bible. The problem in modern terms was only exacerbated by the recovery of this outside world to which the biblical authors refer. The recovery begins, I would argue, in the late 18th century, goes into uh, increased motion in the first part of the 19th, and then into hyperdrive at the end of the 19th and on into the 20th. The recovery I'm talking about means, first of all, simply visits to the modern Middle East to find the monuments of the past, and then 
the systematic archaeological discovery of that range of cultures from antiquity, and then the decipherment of the languages of the cultures recovered so that we can begin to read as well as see visually what these cultures thought about themselves and not simply do it through the medium of the Hebrew Bible or the medium of classical Greek and Latin authors or to some degree through Islamic tradition, through Muslim tradition, which were the sources available to Europeans essentially before this archaeological recovery be began. And it became clear certainly by the latter part of the 19th century that all kinds of contacts could be drawn between Mesopotamia, Egypt, the world of what the Bible calls the Canaanites, the Hittites of ancient Turkey, all kinds of contacts could be maintained between, uh, could be discovered between these cultures and their own writings and art and what was in the Bible, such that the issue became in what sense is the Hebrew Bible and mutatis mutandis one can do the same thing for the New Testament in the Jewish and greco roman worlds later, but in what sense is the Hebrew Bible and the Israel from which it comes a part of this broader ancient Near Eastern world? It, Israel and the Bible are in this world, but are they of this world? And so you get a fascination corresponding to what's in the book of Deuteronomy or what is in Philo and Josephus, a fascination in the modern era with trying to figure out where does Israel belong in this range of cultures. Is it distinctive? Well, in one sense, everybody's distinctive and everybody's the same. Where do you draw the lines with the biblical text? And myth became one of the flashpoints then, a recovery of what Philo and Josephus said in the words of a G. Ernest Wright or Yechezkel Kaufman or others. Some would argue that we are beyond that point now, but I frankly don't think so. And one measure of it is a very simple phrase that one still sees all over the place when one wants to talk about the Hebrew Bible and ancient Israel in this world of the ancient Near East. You usually see it phrased as the Bible and the ancient Near East. Not the Bible in the ancient Near East or the Bible as a part of the ancient Near East, but the Bible and the ancient Near East. Think about that for a moment. On the one hand, this kind of phrase is historical nonsense. The Bible is a part of the ancient Near East. It's a text like many others. So and here can't be an historical statement. It has to be a philosophical one. And for those who don't like it, one could argue an apologetic one. Namely, yes, it's in the ancient Near East, but it's not of it. Well, I've been talking in and around the subject of myth without defining it. And I've done that purposely because it is such a difficult word to define. Everybody has his or her own sense of what the word means and on that basis seeks to either argue for or against the concept as it concerns biblical religion. It's clear from the uh, text I briefly read from Ernest Wright that he has a very particular concept of myth. Myth is something that is opposed to history. History are, is a, a phenomenon of facts that can be in some way verified in the past of human populations. I could think of the past of nature too, but Wright doesn't want to talk about the history of nature because that separates uh, and confuses the distinction he's trying to make. Myth is not about history then for Ernest Wright. Myth is about the great cycles of nature. The gods who are involved in mythic uh, tales are gods who in some way or another, signal the sun that's to come up in the morning, the rains that we hope we'll get, but not too much of, uh, the capacity to make love and war at the same time, and so forth and so on. Uh, and these 
stories and the gods that exemplify these stories, these stories which Wright and others have called myths, are then celebrated in periodic enactments, performances, rituals, so that you don't simply hear the story read or, or spoken aloud, but you see it instantiated, performed. <clears throat> now that's one definition of myth. And if you notice, it carries another feature that I haven't singled out yet, but we, and which Wright himself doesn't quite indicate, but it comes out in others of, of, uh, of those who would share this point of view. That myth is basically about gods, not about God. A single god can't have a mythology. Others suggest otherwise. <clears throat> if we talk about myths in Soviet Russia or about John Kennedy, President John Kennedy being a mythic hero, <clears throat> we are first of all not talking obviously about gods, we may be talking about superhuman folks, or at least people who we think are superhuman, uh, but we do so, at least in this country, presumably through a monotheistic kind of culture, a culture that all of us uh, say we subscribe to, that there's simply a single god. So here's another definition which runs a little counter to what is in uh, uh, G. Ernest Wright and his associates. Indeed, as I think about the term myth, I think about it in terms of a series of oppositions. Truth versus falsity. Does myth bring us a certain truth about reality? Or in some people's usage, is it simply an inadequate representation of reality, even a deceptive representation, a false representation? I've already mentioned the issue of history versus myth. And another of our teachers, Frank Cross, helped to introduce a third element here, epic history and myth, all of which uh, represent differing, although related, phenomena. Myth involved in the opposition between monotheism and polytheism. Myth versus science. Is myth primitive science only to be eclipsed when we get the real thing? Myth and its enactment or performance in ritual. And finally, one could argue, myth as a literary type and myth as a conceptual orientation. Myth as a certain way of telling or writing and myth as a way of thinking about reality. All of these different kinds of oppositions you will find coming together in the study and use of the term myth by all kinds of people. If we go back to the etymology of the term, we are helped and not helped at the same time. The word is a Greek word, as most of you are familiar, mutos. But when you read of it in, for example, the Iliad, it's not a myth in the sense that we are talking about. It is a story uh, that carries with it a certain truth conviction. It can be a story of heroes, human heroes. It's only when you get to Plato on the one hand and Thucydides on the other, at the end of the fifth century, do you begin to get this negative view of myth. Thucydides, for example, says in the introduction to his Peloponnesian War that I am writing real history here, the history essentially that I myself have been able to witness as a member of the events that I'm going to record. I'm not writing about the mutoi, the myths, if you will, and here we could perhaps use it, which my predecessors had indulged in too profligately. <clears throat> and yet again, I come back to more positive assessments. Anthropologists use the term myth regularly to describe tales of the cultures that they investigate not only non-Western so-called primitive cultures, but a whole range of possibilities, myths as tales which say something significant about the cultures from which they come. All of which then leads me to the following tentative definition. 
of the term. Myth is, first of all, a story. It can be an oral or a written story. It's a narrative that proceeds from A to B to C. It's a story that has a public face. It's not simply something to be told in the privacy of one's own home, but it is something that has a public significance. Now, if the home is a, that of an extended family, fine, then public and private begin to merge. And it has this public face because myth seeks to narrate stories about public institutions, public values, public behaviors, to lay them out for the audience that will listen or read so that these behaviors, institutions, and values can be explained, can be justified, can be brought into connection with the societies from which they come. <clears throat> there is a sense, in other words, in which the myth is a representation of the community to which it belongs, and yet, at the same time, it also, many of these myths tend to operate as universals. They take the specific details of the community and enlarge them to the universal. Most societies have myths or tales about how they originated as societies. And these merge very quickly with tales about how the earth originated, indeed about how the cosmos originated. In ancient Mesopotamia, there is a famous origin myth called Enuma Elish, after its first two words, went on high. It talks about the construction of the cosmos that the Babylonians and Mesopotamians then knew. And it's a story of a wicked fight between a primeval goddess and a young, vigorous male god who has four ears and four eyes, but okay, fine, he's a god. When the male god defeats the female and cuts her body up to create the universe in the order that we come to know it, the central part of that creation is the establishment of the city of Babylon, which just happens to be the site of the principal temple to this male god whose name is Marduk. Marduk is not simply the center of Babylonia. In this tale, it's depicted as the center of the universe, or to use the term that Nina Tumarkin referred to, the axis mundi, the center, the axis of the world. And this tendency to take a particular local feature, in this case Babylon, and elevate it to universal uh, proportions is typical of all myths. Finally, I would say myths tend to involve the human, the natural, and the extra-earthly all at one. Myths do not have to be simply about gods or the celestial or heavenly world, but they usually involve some kind of contact between the human world and what's beyond the human world, the world of nature and the world of the heavens, if you will, the world of the extraterrestrials. Now what I want to suggest is that with a definition like this, which elides or passes beyond a number of the oppositions I earlier sketched out, that between, for example, history and myth. We'll find that there is some history in myth and there's some myth in history. With this kind of definition, the biblical world does not look so strange. And here, if you happen to have your handouts, I'd like to make the point in greater detail. The handouts that I've given to you deal with four case studies. We may not have time to go through them all this evening. The first is number one, Genesis 6 verses 1 to 8. The second, which deals with creation, temple building, and ritual, 
comprises Numbers 2, 3, and 4, Genesis 1, Exodus 20, and then a comparison of a later a section of Exodus with Genesis 1 to 2. The third case study is from the book of Job, and I've given two portions of it, uh, Gen uh, Job 26, and then part of the speeches in which God appears to Job at the end in, in a whirlwind, and talks about two creatures, Behemoth and Leviathan. This is numbers five and six on your handout. And the last is what I might call political liturgy. Political liturgy, and that's Psalm 29 as number seven. Let's see how far we get before I drive you crazy. Number one, if you're thinking of myth in terms of what you had in high school, or maybe even in college, as uh, the Greek myths, uh, reading from the Iliad, reading from Ovid, uh, reading from Hesiod, you name it, then the opening lines of Genesis 6 should not surprise you. When people began to multiply on the face of the ground and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that they were fair and they took wives for themselves of all that they chose. Then the Lord, and wherever you see Lord, this is Jimmy or Yahweh. Then Jimmy said, my spirit shall not abide in mortals forever for they are flesh. Their day shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and afterwards when the sons of God went into the daughters of humans who bore children to them. These were the heroes that were of old, warriors of renown. Now, this text has a lot of peculiarities in the Hebrew, which I won't get into. But what immediately strikes you, whether you know the Hebrew or not, is that here you have gods and human beings getting married to each other and giving birth to people who are regarded as heroes, warriors, Nephilim. This is sort of like the birth of Hercules or Heracles. And this text has always fascinated people because it's about the closest thing we have in the Hebrew Bible to what we think of as a Greek myth. The immediately following verses seek, I would suggest, to tame that striking and surprising picture that the first four verses have given us. For it tells us that Yahweh saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. Boy, that, that's a little bit of uh, the King James which has survived here. And Yahweh was sorry that he'd made humankind on the earth and it grieved him to his heart, so he said he was going to blot out everybody. A number of interpreters, again with a very long history here, have suggested that verses five to eight quite deliberately follow on verses one to four, because this marriage of humans and gods was something that uh, was a no-go. It shouldn't have happened. It violated the boundaries between heaven and earth, between gods and humans, and the result was the wickedness of humankind. Be that as it may, we have here something, maybe the parallel that jumps immediately to mine is of the church father, Eusebius's Preparatio Evangelica. This is a text where Eusebius went back to all the pagan mythology to see if he could find any premonition in these Greek and Roman myths of the coming of Christ and of the Christian message. And uh, as a result, he provided a treasure house for us of mythology that otherwise would have disappeared. At times it looks, reading the text, as if Eusebius was really quite interested positively in these old tales. At other points, he makes invidious comparisons between these tales and the Christian message of which he as bishop obviously upholds. But here we have a text that could c convince, I suspect, even G. Ernest Wright and Yechezkel Kaufman that something is lurking in the biblical text that uh, you can't completely dismiss. <coughs> Genesis 2, 3, and 4 complicate the picture. Or I should say number 2, Genesis 1. Number 2, 3, and 4 complicate the picture. 
Here I have drawn a selection from the first section of the book of Genesis, the first account of creation, the account of six days of creation and the seventh and rest, and that's in number two. And then two echoes of this uh, creation account uh, in the book of Exodus. Let's take a look at the number two for a moment. I've only given you a portion of it clearly here. Again, you could spend uh, a whole lifetime on this first chapter, and people have done so, and the, every once in a while I go to the library to find material on this, and I come out dizzy. There's just too much of it, and there's no end to it. Uh, here I'd like to concentrate on one feature of it, which emerges really from text number four, and from the article that I refer to you, you two there of the late Israeli scholar Moshe Weinfeld. What kind of text is Genesis 1? Through chapter 2, verses 4b. <clears throat> In other words, it ends, uh, 4a, excuse me. Uh, this first unit doesn't end with the end of the first chapter. It goes on into the second chapter, and I'm one who reads uh, the first part of 4 as part of it. Notice how that ending uh, is given to us. In chapter 2, verse 1, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished in all their multitude, and on the seventh day God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. Now the next line is where the debate has come. Does it belong with what follows or is it the final line of what proceeds? I'm inclined to think it's the final line of what proceeds. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Looking back, what kind of text is this? I submit to you, and this is in part what Moshe Weinfeld says, although he doesn't want to use the word myth for this. He comes awful close, but I think lurking in his body is somehow the notion that myth still, let's call it by another name. But this is an origin myth, very much like the myth that I referred to a few moments ago from Mesopotamia called Enuma Elish, where uh, the god Marduk defeats this sea god, goddess, uh, Tiamat, and creates the world and Babylon out of it. We don't have a combat like that here. We may have an intimation of it at the beginning, but I'll leave that aside. But the two texts, this one and the Babylonian text or Mesopotamian text, I submit are alike in that they both want to tell you how the world began in terms of specific institutions within the culture of Israel that is telling that. And that's where Weinfeld's point comes into play. Number three begins to make this connection for us. Here in the first of the two uh, versions of the Ten Commandments, we're told to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, to labor for six days and do all your work, but to rest on the seventh. Why? For in verse 11, in six days Yahweh made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. In other words, why do we observe the Sabbath? not because some body of Israelite elders decided, well, it'd be good to rest periodically. I mean, you can't work constantly. So let's go by seven. And yeah, this has a rough correlation with the way the moon appears, the lunar calendar, and it'll be fine. Our text has nothing of that. For our text, the Sabbath was a gift of God to the world. It was set up with the very creation of the world. It's not an arbitrary phenomenon that human beings decided on. We know, for example, from the ancient Near East that one group of, uh, one culture, the so-called culture of Assyria in its old phase, operated on the basis of a five or 50 year, a 50 day period. Seven was not automatic. For this text, however, 
This is built into the very fabric of the universe in the same way that Babylon in the Mesopotamian creation story of Enuma Elish is part of what the gods designed. It wasn't simply built by humans. But we can go further, and this is number four that Weinfeld uh, brings to bear. As he points out, this correlation under number four was seen by several of his predecessors, Martin Buber, for example, and Umberto or Moshe David Casuto. But they didn't make quite the connection that I think Weinfeld has correctly made. Namely, that if you look at the way the story of creation is narrated in Genesis 1 through the first part of 2, and Weinfeld here quotes several lines in the right-hand column from Genesis 1 to 2, you see that it is the same kind of language on a seven-day period that describes in Exodus chapters 39 and 40 the way that Moses had the first portable sanctuary, the portable tabernacle in the wilderness built for Israel. In other words, the tabernacle, this portable temple, if you will, that followed the Israelites after they left Egypt through the wilderness before they got to the land of Israel, is modeled on the story of creation, or the story of creation is modeled on the tabernacle. In any case, there is an indelible connection between them. And for Weinfeld, this suggests, and I think he's quite correct here, that this story of creation in Genesis 1 through 2 was meant actually to be recited, probably in some kind of liturgical ceremony within the sanctuary, and the sanctuary ultimately meaning here the Temple of Jerusalem. To this day, in fact, the last portion of this text, chapter 2, verses 1 uh, uh, through 3, sometimes 4, 2, uh, is recited on uh, Friday night at the beginning of the Sabbath observance of Jews, replicating what Weinfeld feels was the ancient temple uh, setting of this text. What am I saying here? I'm suggesting that we have here functionally and in basic content a myth a text that tells us about a fundamental institution of ancient Israel, its Sabbath, when no work, or at least most kinds of work, cannot be performed. It tells us the origin of that institution, and it explains why it's necessary to have it, and it connects it with another institution, namely the sanctuary, or more specifically, the temple in Jerusalem exactly as the so-called pagan myths of the ancient Near East do all over the place. And knowing this doesn't cheapen the tale, doesn't suggest, ah, oh, it's a piece of junk oriented to us by individuals who, you know, basically were primitives in their thinking and couldn't realize that the uh, weak was actually an astronomically correlated institutions set up by human beings. No, it suggests that this institution is so fundamental to the culture, is so much an emblem of what ancient Israel ought to be, that it has to have been divinely ordained. Yes, human beings may have had a share in implementing the divine directive, but something so fundamental can't be simply a whimsical human decision. Let me turn, I'll have to leave Mr. Job out for a moment, and if you'd like, you can ask me a question about it, and I'll do my best to respond. But let me turn to number seven, Psalm 29. I grew up knowing this psalm again from Jewish liturgy. Because on the Sabbath, particularly on the eve of the Sabbath, on Friday nights, Jewish holidays always beginning the night before, 
This is one of the psalms that are recited as a part of the Shirot HaShabbat, the songs of the Sabbath. Then I learned when I got to college that this was actually composed by Canaanites. And I did a double take and uh, got kind of shaken up and decided that if anybody could make such an outlandish statement like this, maybe this was a field worth exploring. Here I am. What's going on here? In the 1930s, the scholar H.L. Ginsburg, Harold Lewis Ginsburg, uh, presented a paper at the Orientalist Congress in Rome, 1935. So it was a wonderful time to have it. Uh, I don't know whether Mussolini and company were there to greet them or not, but in any case, it was Ginsburg, raised as a traditional Jew, uh, who said, if you look at this carefully, in the light of new discoveries that were just coming out at the time of an ancient Canaanite city, Canaanite in culture, not politically, called Ugarit, you have stuff here that just echoes what I'm reading in the Ugaritic texts. Ascribe to the Lord, again, it's Jimmy or Yahweh, ascribe to Yahweh, B'nai Elim, sons of gods, Heavenly beings is a slight dodge here. Ascribe to Yahweh glory and strength. Ascribe to Yahweh the glory of his name. Worship Yahweh in holy splendor. I'm sorry if it's a little unclear there. I almost broke the back of my Bible to Xerox this, but I didn't want to go that far. The voice of Yahweh is over the waters. The God of glory thunders, Yahweh over mighty waters. The voice of Yahweh is powerful, is full of majesty. The voice of Yahweh breaks the cedars, the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like an, a calf and Syrian, which is another name for a mountainous region in the Lebanon, at the southern end of it, it makes Syrian like a young wild ox or like a bull. The voice of Yahweh flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of Yahweh shakes the Midbar, the wilderness. It shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of Yahweh causes the oaks to whirl, strips the forest bare, and in his temple all say, Kavod, glory, glory, glory. Hechalo, kulo, omer, kavod, in Hebrew. Finally, Yahweh sits enthroned over the flood, an archaic word here apparently, Mabul. Yahweh sits enthroned as king forever. May Yahweh give strength to his people. May he bless his people. May Yahweh bless his people with peace. What Ginsburg pointed out was several things. First of all, the geography of the text. It does not seem to be the geography of the land of Israel or of Palestine. It seems to be the geography of the area immediately north the Lebanon and maybe even part of Syria. Hence the reference to Lebanon and Syrian. The problem was Kadesh because everybody immediately thought of a place in the Sinai Desert, Kadesh Barnea. But as Ginsburg pointed out, that term is never used. The Bible is called something else. And there is a northern Kadesh where a famous battle took place in antiquity. And if this Kadesh is to agree with Lebanon and Syrian, maybe it's the northern Syrian uh, Kadesh that's being referred to. We have God, in other words, coming in from the waters and then wreaking havoc on the cedars, the cedars of Lebanon, and Syrian and Kadesh. He comes in, in other words, across the Mediterranean. He's sort of, you know, coming in for a landing is really what's happening here. And he sort of circles around and he comes in and he ends up at uh, Ben-Gurion Airport, otherwise known as his throne, where everybody says, Kavod, glory, he's here. And then he sits enthroned, it says, on the flood, which is this ancient word, Mabul, enthroned as a king forever, where he gives strength to his people. And now, presumably, although the people aren't named, 
if we read this in an Israelite setting, it has to be Israel. Now what Ginsburg suggested was, if you take out the word Yahweh, what you have here is a description that we now know in his day in the 1930s, already we're beginning to know from these texts from Ugarit of the god Baal or Hadad the quintessential god of the storm, of the rains, and one of the principal gods of the Canaanite pantheon. <clears throat> All these descriptions here and much of the language could be paralleled or assumed for Baal. And the fact that the text starts in the geography where Baal is primarily located only confirms this. Two particular points brought the matter home. The first is the first two lines, which are described here, uh, translated here as ascribed to Yahweh. Havu ladunai b'nei elim. Ginsburg already identified this as a special kind of parallelism. Everybody had recognized for some time that biblical Hebrew poetry tends to work in lines that are parallel to each other, sometimes antithetic, Sometimes one completes the other, where you say either the same thing or its opposite in the second line following the first. But here, said Ginsburg, is a special kind of parallelism, which he called, I think, climactic parallelism, because it builds an intensity by leaving the line unfinished and forcing you to go to the next line to finish it. So the first line, ascribed to Yahweh, O oh, sons of gods, ascribe what? There's no object given here. You have to go to the next line to find it. Ascribe to Yahweh glory and strength. Ascribe to Yahweh, then you change the object, the glory of his name. And finally, the last line changes the verb from ascribe to worship, the Yahweh in holy splendor. And that sort of brings the whole thing to a conclusion, a rhythmic conclusion. Now, said Ginsburg, if you look into the Ugaritic texts, the texts from ancient Ugarit, you find this kind of climactic, or sometimes it's been described as staircase parallelism, as you ascend the staircase, you find that this is a feature of, uh, of Ugaritic poetry. But for me, the payoff came many years after Ginsburg wrote in an article by the late Aloysius Fitzgerald, taught Brother Aloysius, who taught for many years at the Catholic University of America. In a short article in 1974, he showed that if you take out all the times, all the places where the word Yahweh is mentioned and put back the word Baal, you get alliteration and assonance that disappears once you put Yahweh in. So, let me read this. Just two lines. Bear with my Hebrew. In the text that we now have, Havu la, dona, havu la, la Yahweh, I'll read it this way. Havu la Yahweh b'nei elim. Over against Havu la Baal b'nei elim. Notice more Bs. Havu la Yahweh kavod va'oz. Havu la Baal kavod. V and B are the same uh, sound, but in two different forms. Havu le Baal kavod va'oz. In short, by replacing all the Yahwehs with Baals, you get a text which, in terms of its sound patterns, is much tighter, much more uh, uh, synthetic, much more synchronized than with Yahweh. And this suggested to Fitzgerald, as it has to others, that really what we have here is a text that was originally composed for the Canaanite god Baal, but now shifted to Yahweh. So what does all of this mean? Big deal, you say. Fine, this is what I'm sending my son to college for. <laughs> well, there's the love of discovery that's one thing. But we have to ask the question, why would, they, why would some Israelite author have taken over a text like this? What was the point of it? Well, all cultures do this, of course. We borrow right and left. Sometimes we acknowledge the borrowing, sometimes we don't. Uh, 
the whole notion of a footnote, by the way, as Anthony Grafton of uh, Princeton has pointed out, is a relatively recent phenomenon in human history. It, it did not bother the ancients, although the Book of Chronicles tries to come close. Um, but we all borrow and we all adapt, so we shouldn't be surprised here. But here's a text that I grew up reciting on the eve of the Sabbath as one of the most dramatic demonstrations of my faith in the God of Israel, and I find out it's Tabal. <laughs> the end of the text, translated for you as may Yahweh give strength, or may Baal give strength to his people, may Yahweh or Baal bless his people with peace, brings the text away from nature into a human realm, as a number have pointed out, thus confuting the argument that uh, the Israelite God is only about nature, is only about history and not about nature, and that gods like uh, Baal of the Canaanites are only about nature. Obviously, the two realms of history and nature, if you will, bleed into each other, all the more so when you think about the fact that you can have a history of nature. Um, the problem in trying to figure out what this text is really doing is uh, bedeviled by the fact that we can't really date it clearly, which is a problem with much of the literature of the Hebrew Bible. I once wrote an article, in fact it was the first that uh, Father Clifford allowed into the Catholic Biblical Quarterly, he was very generous as I think about it now, <laughs> in which I followed a number of other people suggesting that this text uh, may have belonged to the monarchy of David and more likely Solomon, who otherwise uh, we know from what's uh, recounted to us in the Book of Kings had a great deal to do with Canaanites and Phoenicians around him. And in fact, Ginsburg suggests that in his first essay on this text, that this was a text that used Canaanite language and imagery because perhaps in the reign of Solomon you had a king who was consciously, at least as the biblical text present him, important qualification, as the biblical text presents Solomon, he had extended his interests, his, his at least uh, uh, sphere of influence beyond the realm of the Israelite tribes into some of the realms to the north that historically belonged to Canaan. And perhaps you have here a text that is designed to suggest that as I have extended my sphere of influence, so Yahweh is a God not just simply of a small group of Israelites, but he's a God who can reasonably uh, say he is the God of peoples outside of Israel, like the Canaanite world, and he does what you call your God Baal doing, but Yahweh does it one better. And we get that kind of thinking in other parts of the Hebrew Bible. But here, what I'm talking about is a text that then moves into the realm of a public statement. It is a kind of narrative of what this God does. It has apparently a ritual or liturgical setting, as its last lines make clear, again in the temple. For all intents and purposes, it's not simply a Canaanite myth, it has become an Israelite myth. So how do we conclude then from all of this material? What do we say then about the problem of myth in the Hebrew Bible? I'd like to suggest that myth is both a conceptual and a literary category. As a literary category, it is a tale. It is a story, and even in a piece of liturgical poetry like this, we have a story of the God coming in off the waters through the hinterland until he comes to his temple where he triumphantly claims his kingship. It's conceptual in that it seeks to link various realms of reality, the human, the natural, and the divine. Myth is also something not peculiar to any one culture or any one time or any one place. Thus, the category myth cannot be used, it seems to me, 
as a way of differentiating Israel from its neighbors. We would have to say certain kinds of myths are practiced in Israel which are not in uh, the neighboring world. And in this regard, one issue that I have opened but haven't resolved deliberately is the possibility that when some of the Israelite or biblical texts mention God with other divine beings against whom God is put into some kind of conflict, the question is whether these are dead cliches, as Kaufman argued, or whether they still carry with it, carry with them a sense of, yes, there is a problem here, that God, the God of Israel has to reclaim, if you will, periodically, his status as El Supremo. My colleague John Levinson wrote a brilliant book on this subject some years ago, Creation and the Persistence of Evil, the Jewish Drama of Divine Omnipotence, where he argues that these texts where God is shown in conflict with others, and I haven't given them to you except the ones about uh, Job could be counted in that regard, that there is a sense that yes, God is going to win the battle against Rahab or any of these other sea monsters, but he's got to win it. And he has periodically to certify that he is El Supremo. Myth, I would suggest, puts the quotidian in terms of the cosmic, or in reverse, puts the cosmic in terms of the quotidian. Big fancy words. It takes the everyday and reveals a range of dimensions beyond the ordinary that extend to other human groups, that extend to nature, that extend to the universe. And so <clears throat> reveal to us that every phenomenon with which we deal is not simply something literal. It has a whole range of aspects that we have to take into account. That Lenin, to go back to where I began, was not just simply a figure of history who died at the end of the Bolshevik Revolution and made a revolution, but he's become Papa Lenin, or you used to see uh, in Soviet days people wearing little labels of the baby Lenin. It wasn't the baby Jesus, it was the baby Lenin. Of course, the official ideology of the communist regime was that it was anti-religious, as you may define the term. <clears throat> and so finally, I would suggest that while myth in this multidimensional orientation, human, natural, cosmic, may be something from what, that is different from what we in the West called history and science, the boundaries here are not rigid. They're porous, allowing for juxtaposition, blending to the enrichment of all elements. In short, being able to read the Bible mythically doesn't brand it as something objectionable. It opens up worlds and confirms the status of the text as indeed the living icon that it is. Thank you very much. has agreed to take some questions. Let me invite questions. Please. Always a... Sure. Could you, could you briefly compare and contrast your take on myth to Karen Armstrong, uh, Karen Armstrong's who talks about mythos and logos? Ka which book of Karen Armstrong? Uh, the Case for God, which is misnamed, but it's called The Case for God. That book, I'm afraid I haven't read, so I can't respond to it directly. I mean, she's uh, quite an extraordinary author, you know, who's written about everything, and that was one I missed. Perhaps you could raise the question for me that she raises that you'd like to uh, discuss, and I'll do my best to respond that way. <clears throat> 
Um, okay. She talks about, I'll try to be brief, she talks about myth as the mythical, mythical, mystical, that which can't be seen and that which can't be, say, put into words, that which you don't get through your head, that part of religion rather than the untrue part. And yeah. she contrasts that to the, um, to the logos part of society, the practical, learning how to hunt, um, going, you know, moving your tribe to a new place. And so she talks about modern religion. Religion at various times has dumped mythos, she, she would say, to its detriment. Uh -huh. Is that clear enough? Okay. I mean, if I've heard you correctly, she takes... Okay. She uh, has a basically positive assessment of myth. <coughs> well, I mean, I, I try to suggest in my own way the same thing. Um, as you've defined what she's done, the only um, demurral I might have is the notion that, of this mystical inarticulateness. Uh, the fact is that we can't talk about myths unless we have a text, whether it's oral or written. And <coughs> the, uh, the texts do try to be, as I've suggested, multidimensional. So the the uh, range of meaning that a given text uh, can exhibit is one that uh, repays repeated attention. I mean, the more you read the text, the more you may find in it. But I would be hesitant to jump immediately to the notion that mystical inarticulateness is the first and primary uh, feature of myth that you encounter because if the myths have a public function, and I think that's what continually impresses me about the mythologies I've read from quite a number of cultures, not by any means all of them, I'm not sure anybody could. But if the myth has a public function, then that function should in some way be transparent if it is to serve to explain and to justify institutions, values, behaviors of the societies from which the myths come. If it's entirely mystical and essentially uh, inarticulate, then that function can't really be served. Thank you. Other questions? You're all in favor of it. That's great. <laughs> yes, please. Oh, oh. oh. Oops. A mythical figure, Abraham, uh, the patriarch. Yeah. Could you comment on that? Yeah, sure. Um, I just spoke to him yesterday. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, this use of myth, then, is the use of myth as uh, essentially something that is uh, untrue or non-existent. And we, that's, that's the way we use the term. It's obviously not what I've been talking about. So there are two issues here. One is to explain how the word myth is being used in regard to Abraham, and the second is to tell you whether I did talk to him recently. Uh, in regard to the use of myth here, I would, I, I would not myself want to, to use the term because even if you disagree with what I've said, myth has so many different kinds of meaning that by calling Abraham mythical, you make it more confusing rather than less, given all the meanings attached to the word. As to whether Abraham existed, well, every 20 years we seem to find him. Um, I, a late colleague of ours got awful close. Uh, there were some discoveries made by an Italian team working in uh, Syria at a site called Ebla. And uh, Ebla gave uh, a large number of texts in cuneiform, like what you would find in Mesopotamia and modern Iraq, that come from the late 2000s BC. And supposedly, as these texts were initially deciphered, there were a number of names, personal names and geographical names, that seemed to uh, correlate with what was uh, the names that were in the book of Genesis, both in the 
texts in the chapters before Abraham comes in and in those afterwards. So the initial uh, conclusion of the Italian scholar who was deciphering the text was that uh, the names and the geography of Genesis must come from the same time period and maybe the same geographical world as these Ebla texts somewhere around 2300 BC. This colleague of ours thought that the case as it was presented to him was uh, quite, quite suggestive, indeed uh, quite reasonable, indeed fantastic, wonderful. And he wrote an article about the uh, correlation here. The article was set up in print and he gets a letter from the decipherer saying, I made a mistake. <laughs> that the personal names which I th told you were the same as, in this case, uh, the so-called cities of the plain, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, in cuneiform, they're written and it's not quite clear whether they're the same names as in the biblical tradition. And uh, they're all supposed to be on one tablet. Well, that's not really quite true either. To this colleague's great credit, I mean, he was very upset. The, the, the article was set up. It was about to be printed. And if you go and look at the article, you'll see a little box above what he had written, which says, I have just received a letter from the decipher with the following information. And essentially, it invalidated the whole article. Um, I tell this story because clearly, even for the biblical authors, Abraham is a figure who is alive, who is real, I think. I don't think he's, uh, he, he, to the authors and to the audience, he's uh, an invented character, a, f a fictional character as we would use the term fiction. But at the same time, it looks to me as if he is presented in the book of Genesis, and he's primarily in Genesis. There are references later, but it's amazing how modest the references are uh, to Abraham outside of Genesis in the Hebrew Bible. Um, he's presented as somebody long ago, uh, founder of the community, the uh, originator of the covenant between himself and his family and God, uh, but nonetheless, the stories about him, as many have observed, are narrated in terms of his being a type, a model of X, and we don't get a really rounded biography. So this is suggested to many, and I'm, I'm still, I guess, a conservative in this regard, that probably in the depiction of Abraham that we have, there are historical features, but they may not belong to a single person, but to a whole group of people whom Abraham represents 